Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I think we're going to wait another couple of minutes to let people uh, uh, log on. Oh, we have Chicago and Ohio and New York, California and DC. <laughs> and London. And Cambridge. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we are gonna uh, jump into it because I think we have a lot to cover over the uh, course of the hour. Uh, I'm Martha Devey, the Associate Director at the Stanford Center on Longevity. And along with my colleague, Ken Stern, uh, the Longevity Project, we're pleased to have you join us at the June ses session of the um, Longevity Book Club. Uh, today's session, uh, we're gonna have a conversation with Hal Hirschfeld. And um, we are so lucky to have Hal here with us today. And in many ways, I feel like it's a bit of a, a homecoming for us. Um, Hal is going to be talk about, talk about is going to talk about his recently published book, very recently published book, mm -hmm. uh, Your Future Self: How to Make Tomorrow Better Today. Uh, it's a homecoming for us because Hal received his PhD here at Stanford, and his faculty advisor and dissertation chair was Laura Karstensen, who is the founding uh, uh, director of the Center on Longevity. I first heard about Hal's work about the future self when I joined the center in 2009. Uh, so it's been really interesting to see how his thinking has evolved, how his research has, has evolved, and how it's, it's resulted in this really terrific, uh, uh, really terrific book that weaves the science and storytelling together so well. Um, Hal's research concentrates on the psychology of long-term decision-making and how time affects people's lives. He talks about time traveling. Uh, it's a critically important issue given the fact that Americans are living longer lives, but often not making necess the mes necessary decisions that will optimize those long lives. And his research has a uh, specific focus on financial decision making and how do we save and finance these longer lives. Uh, as I said, uh, Hal has done a remarkable job of translating his academic research into really practical outcomes. And he looks at questions from both a psychological a marketing and a managerial perspective, and really does a, a terrific job of translating into to actions. Hal's going to talk more about his future selves' work, but his research suggests that when people are connected with their future selves, that connection can influence their decision making. Uh, Hal currently holds the UCLA Anderson Board of Advisors Term Chair in Management, uh, and in the the uh, School of Business has been able to develop collaborations and continues to consult with a number of large financial institutions as well as financial startups and creating tools, helping them create tools that get people to engage very differently. So Hal, thank you very much. It's great to see you. Thank you, uh, Martha. It's so good to see you and nice to see you, Ken, as well. Um, so let's just jump into it. Since your, yeah. your book is it was published June 6th, was that right? Last, last week, exactly. So why don't we start with... Um, Having you describe to uh, our attendees what the concept is of the future self. Sure, absolutely. Um, right. Uh, you know, I, I think the the idea of a future self it may sound a little abstract, but it, it's not that abstract when you think about it. It's basically some future version of us. Now, there can be many, right? So part of what matters here is the the goals that we have in mind. So you know, if if I'm for instance, thinking about retirement, then I may have a very specific future self, a future self at you know the start of retirement. For me, that may be in, in 20 years. For other people, it's 10. For other people, it's 40, whatever it is. But I could also be thinking about my future self in five years. I want to still be able to you know, 
play with my kids in an active way. And that's a different future self. But what's interesting there is that there's also many selves along the way. Like if I want to be healthy in five years, I also have to think about tomorrow morning self and whether I'm going to get up and exercise or eat healthy or what all those things that sort of add up. So there can be many along the way, but really what we're talking about is a version of us who exists at some distant or even not so distant point in time. So how, why, um, why do you start thinking about uh, your future self or all of our collective future selves? Um, and how is the future self important to the notion of good decision making today? Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. So, you know, if you want to know, I, I, it's funny, I don't actually talk about this that often because it, it really goes back a, a ways, but to some extent it happened right um, at Stanford with, um, with Laura Carsonson, right? You know, this was it, not that many, it was probably around 2007 or so, it was not that far off from the financial crisis. Not that I knew about it or she knew about it, but we'd have this conversation when we were talking about you know, what are some of the big, important societal problems that we should study? And she looked at me and she said, you know, retirement. Psychologists don't say enough about retirement. Uh, maybe you should look into that. And I was like, I don't know, 25. I was not that. I was like in my mid 20s. And I think I'm, I think I said to her, or maybe at least I thought that sounds so boring. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she was like, that's the problem. Um, you know, I started digging into it. There's there's of course economic reasons why we don't we don't save for retirement or we don't think about retirement in the the deeper ways that we should. But I got really interested in the psychology and psychologically speaking, why do we have a hard time considering long term and not even long term futures? But why do we have a hard time considering the very real consequences of our present day actions? So that was really the first time that I started thinking about it, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but over time, one of the things that we found out was that these connections, these relationships that we have with our future selves, they end up really mattering for things like financial decisions, uh, like saving for the future, but a host of other decisions as well. I'm sure we'll get into this, Ken. I'm happy to elaborate now too, if you want, but but that's just a brief a, a brief intro there. So um, what, what allows some people to make that connection with their future self and Others just can't. Martha, it's a really deep question. Um, in some ways, it's it's sort of like asking what allows some people to be more extroverted and other people to be, um, you know, uh, or, or who other people are more introverted. What allows some people to have more self-control and others less? The reason I say that is because to some degree, these relationships, these connections we have with our future selves are determined by a number of different factors, our upbringing, the modeling that we had from our parents. I'm sure there's some aspect of our biology and genetics in there as well, though we don't, we don't know that for sure, but I, you know, I have a suspicion. Um, but I also bring this up because like other core personality traits, um, these things can change. These relationships that we have with our future selves can change over time and we can be intentional. Uh, about changing them in the same way that we can be intentional about changing some of the other core aspects of our personality. So what, one of the things that sort of, uh, um, I think the listeners might, uh, viewers, uh, uh, might be interested in sort of the importance of the future self to those who, to whether you make good decisions or not. So can you walk us through a little bit, um, the theory of the case, uh, why is, uh, uh, your future self important and uh, what what does it what what does that connection determine for who makes a smart decision who's who's a little bit more frivolous what what might it be called frivolous with their decisions yeah so okay so you know I think the first thing to consider here is that in many ways we think of our future selves as if they are other people that's a funny concept because yeah you know, and I don't mean to get too deeply philosophical, but I think you'll see why this matters. I mean, it's, it's a funny concept because in some ways, like if I were to ask you, you know, are you, Ken, are you the same person over time? Well, that's a weird question, but you say, yeah, I mean, I, my name's still Ken, you know, I mean, I'm sure you still have, you know, your family and your friends and you can probably say on a number of levels, I am who I am, but it's on a deeper level maybe not so true, right? I'm sure a lot has changed for both of you and for people listening, I'm watching, I'm sure a lot has changed between who you were when you were eight <laughs> and who you are now. And one of the things that psychologists and philosophers have noticed is that a, a more sort of um, 
uh, or an easier way to think about who we are over time is to think that we are sort of a collection of separate selves. Uh, I, I mean, I can get into that, but this really gets into why these relationships with our future selves are important. Let me let me like explain. So if we think of our future self as if it's another person, the reason that that's important has to do with the way that we think about other people. So, so what I mean by that is, you know, if, if uh, someone were to stop you on the street, Ken, and ask you for help this weekend moving, like if they were to say, hey, I don't know you, but can you help me move this weekend? Or maybe a better example is like someone you work with, you kind of know them, but you don't know them that well. They're a coworker, you know they exist, but you're not friends with them. And they said, Ken, Martha, will you help me move this weekend? You would probably say, no, I've got a million other things to do. I'd say Martha would be glad to help you. <laughs> Put it on Martha. Perfect. And I would say my 20 year old would be happy to help you. <laughs> There's always somebody else. Well, <laughs> what's funny about this is that, I mean, nobody would say you're being selfish, but they might say, well, you know, you've got your own stuff going on. Well, if my future self is like that person who I wouldn't help, they're like a person I know they exist, but I'm estranged from them to some degree, then in a way, we can understand why I might prioritize today over tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like if my future self is this person I barely know, and then I have the decision about spending a little bit more money on a nicer car or a nicer TV or putting that money aside, or I have a decision about, you know, eating healthier so that my cholesterol is lower. My, you know, my waistline is, you know, thinner, blah, blah. Those are, those are consequences that are going to happen to some, some other guy down the line. Right. And so what it suggests is that if we don't have those strong relationships, if I don't think of my future self as someone who I am connected to, then I may act in ways that, I mean, Ken, to use your phrase, look more frivolous, even though that may not be the case. It may almost be rational um, to sort of do what I want to do today. The, the, the big caveat here is that there are plenty of people who you would drop everything for. You know, you're your kids, uh, your closest friends, your parents, I mean, your spouse, there's lots of people that fall into that bucket. And if I think of my future self in that way, as someone who I feel a sense of responsibility toward, a sense of caring, a sense that I would sacrifice for them, then I will be more likely to do things today that benefit them uh, later on. So opening right up, uh, what, how, um... How is working on this book and on this body of research uh, inspired changes in your life? No, that's a good one. Um, okay, well, I mean, I've been working on, to some extent, I've been working on this research for years. And I used to, when I started doing this research, I used to really think about it quite literally in terms of financial decisions. Um, and so, of course, you know, there's a part of me that said, I, I better be, you know, saving at the 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 most I can and, you know, being wise about my spending and so on. Cause I, you know, I felt almost hypocritical not to, but lately I've thought about these relationships with future selves and these, this research in a, in a different lens. Um, I've thought more about how I spend my time and how I will look back on the time that I spend now, how my future self will look back on it now. And so, you know, that boils down to things like, work obligations versus family. And that's like black and white, but even like the quality of the time that I spend, I have two little kids at home. And, you know, right now for me, my biggest temptation probably is my phone. And, you know, I have on more than <laughs> more times than I care to admit been on my phone rather than paying attention to them. And I, you know, and I, I don't, hopefully I'm not painting a picture of a of, of myself as a bad parent here, but like, um, I have been framing these moments and thinking about them lately as in five, seven, 10 years when my kids are teenagers and not wanting to interact with me, <laughs> will I look back on this time and say, I'm, I, you know, I'm glad I used it the way I did, or will I say, I really wish I'd been more present. And so, so that, that's how Lately, especially mm -hmm. in the last two years or so, that's really how I've been thinking much more deeply about this research. So, so how, let me let me sort of swing back a little bit to this idea of uh, uh, of 
that some people don't have a sort of close relationship with their future self where it's 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 variable um it's a little bit of a strange concept um uh, that I, I may not care that much or think that much about myself five ten years down the road um or may think about the same say it sort of treat that that future self in the same way that i might uh uh, a, a, an occasional coworker or a distant right. coworker, right? Um, but that's not a theory. You, you, I mean, in your book, which is you know beautifully told, uh, I'll say to the group um, and just fun to read. Um, you laid out some research, including brain scans and things like that, that uh, really sort of demonstrated some some that principle. And maybe you could sort of run through a little bit of that and share what what you and your fellow science social scientists have learned. Yeah, no, Ken, it's a great question. And I think it's it's really important to clarify that some of these ideas, they're they're like compelling ideas. As a social scientist, of course, I wanted to test, you know, is there any there there? Yeah. Um, you know, one early set of questions that I had asked basically was like, is there any sort of truth to the idea that we think of our future selves as if they are other people? Um, one way that that I and my collaborators thought to ask that was to use um, neuroimaging tools. Um, it, it turns out there is a, a, a lot of research suggesting that, you know, in the brain, the brain can tell what's me and what's not me. That, that almost feels so simple. Of course that's true, but early uh, social scientists, uh, neuroscientists basically wanted to know like is the self special in the brain and found yeah there's more activity in the brain when i think about me compared to when i think about martha or or you can um, but but interestingly by the way those differences shrink if i think about someone who i'm you know very close to or very similar to uh, and so oh go ahead martha yeah oh no finish fin i was just saying we're already getting a lot of questions so <laughs> oh yeah great perfect okay so um so you know, I had the thought that if, if if the brain can know what's me and what isn't me, well, what would happen when we get people to think of their future selves? Um, and, so, you know, so we did this, we put people into the scanner, we had them think about themselves now and their future selves, as well as another person now and another person in the future. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, sort of say this in high level terms, although, of course, I get into more detail uh, in the book, the, the, the punchline is that on a brain level, the activity that comes about when we think about our future selves looks a lot more like the activity that comes about when we think about another person. Yeah, that's fascinating. Which, yeah. you know, we, we thought it was fascinating too. By the way, we we ran that study twice to make sure like it was real. <laughs> um, uh, you know, other researchers have have replicated similar findings. And so um, it's it's really telling because it, it suggested on some level, we really do think of the future self as if it's another person. And I should say it is an analogy, right? I mean, we, we do turn into our future selves. And like, I never, like my wife is another person. I never turn into her. Um, and so, you know, it's an analogy, but it's an, it's a useful analogy because it really helps us understand um, the, 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 the ways that we think of our future selves. So there's a question, and I think you largely answered it, but I, I want to sort of shape it. The question specifically is, uh, given your rationale, can you be your better self for your future family? Do you see them better as your as their futures? Like, imagine your kids being older and want to be doing things in a stronger way on behalf right. of their future selves? I think, Phyllis, I think it's an incredible incredible question. And it's really insightful, not just about our own sort of individual decisions, but one that may even exist on a collective that goes far beyond our own sort of nuclear units of family. Um, now, I should say, from a research standpoint, this is an open question. Um, so we don't have the data to look at this yet, although it's something I really want to do. I, let me Let me speculate a little bit, though, and suggest that the, you know, when we, when psychologists talk about like the self, part of what we're talking about is all of the different sort of, you know, associations and components that go into that. It's not just me, especially as we get older and we have families, my self concept includes images of my close family as well. And so when I start thinking about my future self, when other people start thinking about their future selves, my guess is that that is not just a siloed representation of the self, but also includes 
the future of family members as well. And so I think it's absolutely, it makes total sense to me that I can take actions now that do things for their benefit as well. And I'll just say really quickly, I've thought about that in terms of my own health, right? So, I mean, we we're talking about time, you know, like how I'd spend time before, but like, you know, there's certain things where I say, well, if I don't take certain preventative health measures, if I don't remember to, to get my physical, et cetera, I could have things that are happening that I let slide. And then that's not just hurting me. That could hurt my kids now and in the future and my, my spouse and, and so on and so on. So, I, so yes, I agree. I think it's a great, a great perspective. So let me bring in another uh, interesting question from the audience, uh, which is about uh, reflexive, but what uh, uh, Mary Lou calls a pervasive ageism in our society. So as we think, you know, and you've actually talked a little about software that allows us to age our own picture of ourselves. If we think, you know, Ken Stern 25 years from now, a picture of uh, an uh, even older guy, uh, I may not like that. Uh, that may be something I don't recognize or want to recognize. Um, how does that play into it? How do we deal with that, um, that challenge? It is such a good question. Um, you know, there is, Mary Lou points out, there's pervasive ageism. Um, ageism is really, it's quite interesting and nuanced. Uh, Mike North and Susan Fisk have some great research looking at it. And it's, and it's not so simple that like we, you know, that people in Western society just think poorly about the elderly because there are times when they think positively, but one time that they do think poorly is when there's a perception that the elderly are taking away resources mm -hmm. um, from current generations, right? So in other words, it's nuanced. It's not like I just look at all old people negatively, but like if I feel like I'm not getting my promotion or my job or whatever it may be, that 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 hurts. Um, now, it it may be the case, and again, this is like another deep question that doesn't have the research yet to back it up. It may be the case that the elderly are the most salient representation that we can see of right now of our own future selves, right? Um, they're there. I can look at my older relatives and say, to some extent, that's probably, that's a good representation of what I may be um, for better or for worse. Um, and so, you know, it's possible that thinking about the elderly in positive or negative terms could be related to the way that we think about our own, our own future selves. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, how does, uh, this is from Marguerite Wilbur, um, how does delayed gratification and impulse control fit into your research? I mean, right, so to some extent, this is, this is the crux of it. Um, so, you know, if you think about delayed gratification, you think about impulse control. Delayed gratification is essentially the ability to withstand temptations right now in service of waiting for something better later on. And I, I was, you know, really lucky. I used to live in New York and I was really lucky to have had lunch on several occasions with Walter Michel, who was the, you know, the delayed gratification guy. And we had some really interesting he was a lovely person to talk to. And we had some really interesting conversations about this. That doesn't, I, I hope that doesn't sound like I'm trying to like name drop. If it, if it is at all, it's the most like academic form of name dropping, right? <laughs> so, um, but, you know, it, one, one of the things that I think is, is relevant here is that the connections we have with our future selves are to some extent antecedents or inputs into our ability um, to delay gratification. It's almost something that happens before beforehand. It's help, it helps explain uh, whether we can delay gratification or not, whether we can withstand impulses or not. And, and then also the actions that we take to make our environments easier so that we can withstand the very real temptations that all of us uh, do, do have to withstand. So when you have lunch with Walter Michelle, do you guys have like a big dessert? I mean, what's the uh, delayed <laughs> gratification there? Yeah, it's very funny. Um, I mean, you know, you know, he pa he passed away a couple of years ago, and when when um, w one of the occasions, I was sort of curious about just that, and uh, you know, he he has he had celiac. I also, it turns out, have celiac. So there wasn't many things that we could eat from the dessert menu. It kind of made it easier. Um, but it, you know, by the way that presented a really interesting insight because he sort of said in one of those lunches and he said it to other people too, certain things that are normally temptation, 
the basket of bread, it's not even a temptation for him because it's just off the table. I can't even, I can't even possibly go there. And it's suggestive of strategies that we can use to try to, you know, to try to put some of those uh, impulse control, to put some of the uh, temptations at bay, that is to, to remove them essentially from, from our environments. I'm happy to dig into that more, but it, I, I know that your question was a joke, but it's, it also kind of, re, re, you know, related to something interesting. Yeah, my, my best questions are jokes, so that's <laughs> how you ran with it. But let me actually sort of the, the slightly more serious one, or the more serious one, which is from the audience. Um, and I do want to come back. I think both Martha and I want to come back to you and sort of talk about strategies, like how do people... Absolutely. Um, yeah, because I think that's, uh, I see that in questions. Um, but there's a question about sort of uh, your closeness to your future se self and age. Yeah. As you get older, do you get closer to your physical, uh, to your future self? Um, not literally, but does it, is there something about that process that helps people grapple with uh, or feel closer to the future self? Yes. So it turns out, and in fact, this is um, research, you know, I'm, I'm mentioning names in case people want to look it up, but, you know, uh, Corinna Lockenhoff, who was also, I mean, and part of this, I'm mentioning this because this is a, you know, Stanford Longevity Center. Corinna was a, a former student of Laura's as well. She has investigated, um, as of I and other work, the relationship between age and these relationships. And as it turns out, as we get older, we do feel more connection to our future selves. In other words, if I were to ask you, how connected do you feel to your future self in five years? And ask, you know, someone who's 25, that same question, and someone who's 65 or 75, that question, the older someone gets, the more connected they feel. I suspect some of that is because life gets a little bit more stable. Um, we don't anticipate as much change uh, between now and later. That said, there are still differences between people that matter for the decisions that we make. So even though everybody may be getting a little bit more connected as they get older, I may have started here, you may have started here, and that, you know, those differences then travel together is my best version of a, of, of, of a graph I can do here. Yeah. Um, the, you know, those differences then may matter for the decisions that we make with regards to our health and our finances and so on and so on. So Hal, I have to say, having um, used a couple of the visualization uh, techniques that you have used in your research, um, the older I get, the more the future self looks like my today self. So I mean, <laughs> uh, Martha, I mean, at least that, because like now, you know, I started working on some of the techniques and we'll talk about them, but one is, you know, age progression and age visualization. And when I first did it, it was like, about 13, 14 years ago, I recently came across some of the photos. Actually, my wife and I were cleaning out our um, like garage together and we came across a printout. And I'm not sure if she thought deeply about it, but she said, wow, the projection of you at 55 looks looks younger than the way you are now. I'm in my mid 40s So I thought that, that made me have some existential crisis right away. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. <laughs> So, 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 uh, can we talk a little bit about um, better decision making, getting closer to your future self? That's a big topic. You spend a lot of the book exploring it. Where do we start? Um, um, if you know, most of the people here are new to the conversation. Um, sure. Where do we start with that conversation? Where do people start and think about better decision making today for tomorrow? So, I think the first place to start is to figure out what is the domain that we're talking about, right? Because I think it's a little bit hard to just say sort of generally speaking better decisions for tomorrow. But let's think about, am I concerned about my health? Am I concerned about my exercise? Am I concerned about my ethical decisions? How am I spend my time? What is the thing that is concerning where we want to make a change? That's sort of, let's start there. You asked, you know, Ken, a really good question of where do I start? And then let's pick a specific future self where I can say in one year, in five years, in 10 years, whatever it may be, I want that version of me to have done X, whatever the thing is, you know, I want them to have sleep more. Again, I think maybe the specifics, these are idiosyncratic, but I think hopefully the examples I'm giving sort of um, conjure up possibilities for people. Um, but then, you know, I, I don't want to stop there because the problem is that the future is it's uncertain and it's abstract, it's unknowable, like all of these problems that can make it so much easier to just kind of 
bury our heads in the sand and just focus on right now. Uh, you know, uh, that's right now is what's happening. And so after sort of picking a specific topic and a specific future self, then let's try to figure out how we can really dial up how vivid and emotional that future self is. Let's paint as clear of a picture of that future self as, as we possibly can. Now, this is one of the topics that I go into in, in depth um, uh, in the book, you know, so I don't want to like, but, you know, well, Martha, you tell me if you want me to sort of go into more depth here. Um, yeah. I am a marketing well, professor, I, I, so I don't, I don't mean to say, you know, well, if you want to know more, you should buy the book, but um, <laughs> no, I can have, I can do a, tell me if you'd like me to talk more. I, and let's jump into that because we're getting lots of questions about, you know, okay, what do I do? But, you know, I've spent a, a, most of my career in financial services and the um, sort of biggest problem and repeated with a study we did just about a year ago and getting to plan, getting people to plan for their retirement. It doesn't matter what age it could be. We asked the question of 25 year olds and we asked the question of 60 year olds is it's the uncertainty about the future. I don't know what I'm planning for. It's so true. And I, we should get into the, I, I want to make sure we, we will get back to the concretes, but that I think that that point, Martha, is so important. And it's something that I've heard more and more, especially from younger generations. Why should I even save? What does it matter? You know, um, it's, a t it's something that I ha had to tackle, um, especially as I was finishing writing the book. You know, one one way to think about this, one way that I handle this is like to acknowledge that, acknowledge there's the uncertainty. I don't know what's going to come. And yet I do know that the future is going to come or I need to at least act like it's going to come. Mm -hmm. um, just because I am unsure or uncertain about the future doesn't mean that time will just sort of stop. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I worry that that attitude of like uncertainty, I'm going to throw my hands up in the air it's only going to exacerbate any problems, the seeds of problems that are planted uh, right now, right? Um, you know, as I was working on the book, I ended up reaching out to uh, this guy, Xander Rose, who's the executive director of the Long Now Foundation. It's up in the Bay Area. And, you know, one of the things he pointed out to me was that, of course, there are present day problems and there's present day uncertainty. Some of our present day problems are very much problems because we failed to deal with them 20, 30, 40 years ago. And you start to wonder what seeds are being planted right now that in 20, 30, 40 years will be even worse on an individual level. If I say, I can't plan for the future, it's too uncertain. All I think I've done is really ramp up the uncertainty and anxiety and difficulty I'll have uh, in, in the future. I apologize to everyone for going off camera for a second. My future self will wonder whether I should have yelled at my son, my teenage son, for interrupting and banging <laughs> on the door. Um, uh, uh, so uh, I think I failed my future self there. Uh, but um, uh, can we talk about sort of the one of the things that brought you to this, as you told the story, was your um, uh, was the about thinking about retirement and saving for the future. Um, a lot of Americans have no savings, um, some because of choice, some because of circumstance. Of course. Uh, what, I mean, there's, and there's tons that you talk a, lots about uh, strategies to help people save more um, and nudges. And so can you talk a little bit about what helps people make better long-term savings decisions um, and, and, how, and how the future self fits into that? Yeah. Okay. So let me say a couple of things. So First off, the the idea that we are having a hard time, that we do have a hard time saving, um, I, I want to make sure that I'm not that we're not putting too much blame on individuals, right? Um, this is a really hard thing to do. Um, you know, to some extent, you have to if you think back, um, we didn't always have to do this, right? When there was, you know, up until the 1980s or so, most employers offered pensions, right? And so what that meant is that, some of my paycheck is going into that pension and then I retire and I just get paid. It's an annuity. I just get paid until I die. And of course, you know, that employers started backing away from that, especially as people started living longer and longer and that became more and more of a financial burden. Um, you know, and then it puts the onus of responsibility on the individual, right? And so now I have to be the one that does this saving. I'm also, by the way, 
have a million temptations right now and and access to credit like I never did before. Plus, you know, not only credit, but now we have buy now, pay later. There's so many different things that make it hard for me to put money aside. Um, and so, you know, one thing that social scientists have done is to try to change the decision-making environment to make it easier for people to do the things that they say that they want to do. I think by the nature of this group, everybody on here probably recognizes the importance of of saving, but it's really important not to sound too paternalistic here, right? Like, um, the, the, you know, the way that I approach things is to say, I have no, I have no value judgment. It's not like I'm saying, Martha, you should be saving more. Ken, you should be saving more. The problem arises when someone says, I want to be saving more. I know I should, but I just can't do it. There's a gap between my intentions and my behavior. So, you know, there are interventions known as behavioral economic or choice architecture interventions. These are the nudges you're talking about, Ken, where mm -hmm. I might, for example, if you work for a traditional employer, I now can automatically enroll you in a 401k or savings plan. Now you can decide to opt out from it, but the fact of the matter is you're automatically enrolled. We know that we are sort of creatures of habit. We are we succumb to inertia. If somebody says you're enrolled, now I have to take you know action to get unenrolled. Eh, I'm probably not going to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you know, th th this has been incredibly useful to get people to to just start saving in this particular space. Mm -hmm. There's still a gap though, because like you know, if you, if you think about this on the nitty gritty, an HR manager is the one who might decide. I'm going to set up automatic enrollment, but then they have to decide, well, what, how much should you be saving from your paycheck? If I auto enroll you at 3%, well, that's better than zero, but it's probably not enough right. to save for a well-funded retirement. So now what researchers call, I really like it. You've got the nudges. Those are the things that change the environment to make you do more of the thing that you say you want to do. And then you've got what we call boosts. Those are the motivation changers, the psychological messaging that can get you to sort of further close the gap. This is where we start thinking about um, future selves uh, and how do I get you to think more deeply about it and have a conversation with that future self. Um, that's really, I think, the link there between these things. So um, you talk about it a bit in the book, and I know there's been other uh, research done, mostly in kind of incentives for healthy behaviors, you know, uh, corporate wellness programs. Um, can you talk a little bit about the success of punishment style interventions? Uh, you know, how long yeah. do they last? Um, right. Right. Is, is it the commitment or is it the punishment? Um, so, you know, in thinking concretely about what are the things we could do, one of the strategies that we can do is sort of if it, you first start by recognizing that I have my, you know, me right now, I say I want to save more, I say I want to not snack at night. I have this future image of myself who wants to look back and say, I, I did it. I, you know, I didn't snack. I did save more, whatever it is. And then there's always the, the version of me who's going to screw it up. Um, that's me tonight who, you know, says I'm not going to snack tonight. And then I come home and I'm tired and my kid has some, I know there's a little thing of peanut M&Ms up in the top. I know exactly, I can picture it <laughs> and like, I'm going to steal some. And so one strategy is sort of recognizing these tensions. Um, we can engage in what's known as a pre-commitment device, a pre-commitment strategy. And what this means is that I put some sort of guardrails on my future behavior to make it easier for me to stay on the path, the path of the thing I want to do. So for instance, I could set up a punishment. If I, let's say I have a goal of only snacking twice a week, okay? Uh, late night snacking, I should say. So one of my favorite ways of enacting this sort of thing, I'll explain it. It's There's a website called stick.com, two Ks, S-T-I-C-K-K.com. So I'll set up my goal and I'll say, all right, uh, I want to, I, I, I only want to snack two days a week anymore. I've not met my goal. Um, I'm also going to pick somebody who's going to help me along the way, an accountability partner. So it's going to be you, Martha. And I'm going to, I'm going to say, okay, Martha, I'm going to ask you, can you please sort of dial in with me every week and check in with me on Sunday and ask me how many times did I snack? I'm also going to give the website my credit card. 
and I'm going to tell it the name of an anti-charity. What's an anti-charity? It is a a group I don't want to give my money to. Um, I will not get political, but um, we can imagine uh, a political campaign that maybe I don't want to donate to. Okay, I'll just leave that there. Um, now, Martha, you're going to call me on Sunday. And say, How did you snack? Now, at this point, I can I can lie to you, but in a way, I'm going to only be cheating myself. <clears throat> I can tell Martha I I did it, or you know what? I I screwed up and I ate three times. I had M and M's three times this week. <laughs> Martha, please don't press the button. Note how you asked me to, to be honest, and you press the button and $250 gets donated to. Now, I there's a lot of nuance here because I have to think about what's the right amount of money to charge? Um, will I even want to sign up for this, right? But here's the thing. These sorts of strategies are incredibly effective if we adopt them it's really hard to get people to adopt them because I don't want to sort of willingly say that I'm going to get punished. But, you know, once I adopt them, you can, you can believe that the possibility of having 250 bucks donated to a presidential campaign that I don't want to donate to, that's going to get me to put the M&Ms back. But is the, is the change persistent after you remove the inter, like if you stop, you know, yeah. Hold off stick. Yeah. It's, 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 this is, um, you know, one of our biggest questions as social scientists is how can I not only change behavior, but change it for good um, and sort of keep it going? It really depends on a number of different factors. I have other interventions where we found that even once we sort of like turn things off, people still end up behaving in the way that, you know, we, we sort of quote unquote wanted them to. What matters here is, did we help someone create a habit, right? And so if, I, if I've if i now created a habit where like, okay, Mondays and Wednesday nights, those are the nights that I snack. And every other night, I just don't. I just don't. Mm -hmm. What's nice about this is now, it's almost like removing that bread basket. It's just, those nights, it's just not an option. It's just sort of taken off the, the table. But getting there, getting to that place where we've, form the habit is really difficult. And a commitment device like we've been talking about is one of the things that can help. So can we ask about sort of the, the so you mentioned that uh, the hard part is getting people to uh, uh, take up that commitment device. So I'm curious about how well Styx has done. Um, you actually told a story about someone who burns a hundred dollar bill every time he did something uh, against his commitment. Um, and my reaction was like, there's no way I'm gonna burn a hundred dollar bill. Um, yeah. I'm not that committed. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm curious, there must be different levels that people can adopt that work for them. Yeah, it's true. Um, that story, by the way, Nir Eyal, he's a, an author and he, he calls it burn or burn. If he doesn't do an activity that burns a hundred calories, he has right above his dresser, he has a hundred dollar bill tacked into the, like a bulletin board with a lighter yeah. right underneath it, you know? And so <laughs> it's, you know, it's really, you know, it's like kind of like, are you really going to do that? So there are levels. Um, there are commitment devices that are very soft, right? So I might just tell you, I'm just not going to snack, and uh, you know, we'll check in with me. Well, what, if I did snack, nothing's happened other than now I feel bad about it. That's still actually quite helpful, but it's not as strong. The strongest forms are the ones where I have a punishment enacted and what's called an accountability partner, somebody who I can actually work with to help me stay on stay on track. I mean, this to some extent is the value of say a nutritionist or a financial advisor or whatever it may be. And I know there's costs associated with that, but there's also costs associated with not working with somebody like that. Right. Um, so, so the commitment I'd like everyone to make is that if they don't, if they snack night, they should send me a hundred dollar bill. Because <laughs> no one wants that. Uh, that'd be a terrible thing. So can we split it? Can we split it? <laughs> sure. Oh, there's a donate button on this center on lunch. Like, happy to make it available to everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you with my bad joke. So, so yeah. No, 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 no. Um, the, the, the point is though, that there are levels, there's, a, there's sort of variability in how effective these things are. And then there's a sort of other level here too, which is that sometimes the, there's the, the research isn't conclusive on this, but there's some research that suggests that the people who are really good at taking up commitment devices are the ones who 
recognize that they have self-control problems. So it almost means that we have to have this sophistication to see, okay, this is a problem. Now I'll take up this commitment to my, this is actually a topic I'm working on right now with one of my graduate students to say, who takes these things up and how can we convince more people to do them when in fact they would be really helpful? So Anna Lau mentions uh, uh, BJ Fogg's Tiny Habits book. And she says, I change best by feeling good, not by feeling bad. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think there's a, there's, you know, research to back that insight up. You know, I think we, what research suggests is that we sort of tend to think that a self-control endeavor must be hard. That like somehow, you know, it's like no pain, no gain. And like, we won't succeed unless we're really pained. In reality, that doesn't have to be the case. And that some of our best behavior change endeavors are the ones where we enjoy the thing. We've figured out some way to make it enjoyable. I know that's a, that's like a whole other webinar in a way. Um, but I mean, but Anna also asked, right? How do you get people to feel good now about saving versus later? Um, you know, there's a, one of the topics I really dig into in the book is it's again, recognizing these tensions between present me and future me um, and recognizing that Present me is always the one who has to make the sacrifice, so to speak. Uh, it's like kind of like a, a bad relationship where like, like imagine you were in a relationship and you were always sacrificing for your partner and they never did anything for you. Um, you know, our future self in some way, it's like, there's this like Groucho Marx quote, uh, what have future generations ever done for us? Yeah. Um, you know, it's like the same thing, right? Like what has that version of me ever done? So one thing... I'm trying to answer this question from Anna specifically. One thing we've done is to try to make the sacrifice feel less painful. So like, just as one example, um, you know, in one particular research study, we asked people to save, you know, sign up for an automatic savings account. And we either asked folks to save 150 bucks a month or $5 a day. Now that's the, it's the same amount of money, five bucks a day it feels easier. Like it feels like now I'm doing something good. It's not that bad. Like I can, I can come up with something that I'll give up for five bucks mm -hmm. and drastically more people sign up for the savings plan. Four times as many people sign up when it's framed as five bucks a day compared to 150 bucks a month. Now to your earlier question, about a month later, some of those folks who were told it's five bucks a day, some of them drop out probably because they're like, <laughs> Oh no, this is really like $150 a month. Mm -hmm. But after a month, like once we get rid of, so like, you know, the 15% the of folks who drop out, after that period of time, the, the rest of the people stay, stay involved in that plan. They make, they figure out how to make it work. And what you've done is you've captured way more people to begin with, even if you get some dropout mm -hmm. after a month. So th this is just one way. And I talk about, you know, we can talk about other ways, but this is just one way we can try to make the present feel easier is to reframe things to make it feel like an easier sacrifice. When I go, I, I, I like to run once I've gone on a run, but I have a hard time getting out of the house to go on a run. And it's like a, you can call it a dumb trick, but I like, rather than saying, I'm going to go on a 45 minute run or a 30 minute run, I'm going to, I say to myself, I'm going to just go on a five minute run and see how I feel. And then maybe I'll go on a five, you know, five minutes more. And like, I kind of know once I start, like, I'm not going to turn around after five minutes, but it's like a, it makes it feel easier. I've now chunked this down into a smaller and smaller bit. Yeah. yeah and that actually um, resonates with me because when I go to the gym, uh, I sort of do things in five minute increments because I can always see the end. Uh, five it, it's exactly. It's really easy. And then it's like, what's the worst case scenario? I go home. Yeah. So, so let's apply. So, uh, you talked, going back to the savings, you've talked about how we've made progress through automatic um, enrollment, right. um, some automatic escalations. What's the next, um, and, and those things have helped, um, but they yeah. haven't gotten us, or haven't gotten people to where they need to be, at least right. uh, at some gross level. Um, what's next? And what are the next ways to encourage savings and help people sure. make sure. better longer decisions? So let me, let me mention two things. So one is, I mentioned briefly this idea of sort of psychological boosts. And I know, you know, I know like Jeffrey asked, you know, like what are something concrete, you know? And so 
one thing concretely that we've started doing is to try to dial up the vividness of the future self by showing people their future selves, by having them write a letter to and then from their future self. Uh, a um, European bank actually just used AI. Of course, we made 50 minutes without saying AI, but um, <laughs> they used AI to, they had people, they had their banking customers upload a picture of them. And then they said, describe your ideal day in retirement. Yeah. So this one woman says, I'm running through a field of poppies with my three golden retrievers. And they, you know, she presses a button and there's this beautiful picture of her age 30 years in the future with these purple flowers around her. And, you know, there's one golden retriever on the front and two in the back. And it's a vivid picture. Now they, they claim that this is dramatically increased interest in their retirement products. That's a specific thing, but on a more general level, Ken, I think when you say what's next, I think an appreciation for what researchers call heterogeneity comes next. So all of these sort of nudges have taken place in, in sort of a one size fits all context, ignoring the very real differences that may exist between people. And what I'm seeing now is a move toward understanding what sort of intervention might work better for you, Ken, and better for you, Martha? And it's not crazy, right? Like we can use, and researchers have used machine learning techniques to figure out which messaging and intervention strategies will work better for which different groups of people. And then let's proactively reach out to people with different types of messages and different types of interventions so that, you know, all ships can rise, but in different, using different techniques. Um. So we only have a few minutes left, and I have to say how uh, when I was reading the book over the weekend, you you are a terrific storyteller, and you make this all so appropriate. You make the science really thank you. Cool. Um, what what were some of your favorite stories from the book? Um, I think one of my favorite stories was, uh, okay, it was actually a guy that I met that I got to meet over the course of writing the book, this guy, Greg um, Tietz, he, he uh, a Bay Area guy as well, actually. Um, back in the nineties, he was like in his twenties, he's living in the Bay Area and he was, uh, he was in the market for a tattoo. And um, he would, he would have one day off a week from his job. He stayed up late working as like a bouncer at this, uh, this club bottom of the hill. And uh, one of these days off, he's walking around the, the mission, which is a little area where there's, you know, you can get burritos there. And he comes across a restaurant and right next to the logo, which is like a little boy with a floppy hat on a corn cob rocket ship. <laughs> this is the logo for the restaurant. There is a sign, that, big letters. It says, tattoo me on your body and get free food for the rest of your life. And he looked at that and was like, this is incredible. He goes and he has a burrito the next day he gets this tattoo <laughs> and I, it became there like every so often there's a news story about this guy and I read about it and I like, I thought, Oh my God, that sounds crazy. Like, and I got really like, you know, worried, like, would you end up regretting this? And I, I, I wanted to talk to him because I thought this could be an interesting instance of like focusing on right now and not enough about later. And I got a hold of him. He's in his fifties now. Um, and I asked him, first off, do you have more tattoos? Like I figured like if anybody who gets that, it's going to be like covered in tattoos now. And he's like, no, I have one tattoo. <laughs> and, oh, by the way, the restaurant closed. Uh, and so, you know, like a Greek spot open, he could get some free Greek food, but, and, um, I asked him if he regretted it and he, it was so interesting. He said, not for an instant. And I asked him why, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm like really different now from who I was in my twenties. Like he's in a corporate job and he like, he doesn't stay up late at night. And he's like, you know, he can't go to the bottom of the hill every night and bartend and bounce and all. But he said, every time I look in the mirror, I'm connected back to that version of me. And one of the things that I loved in talking to him, I felt so wise. I felt like such a wise insight to me is that it, really appreciates and respects the idea that we can change over time, that we change from the past to the present, and that we will continue to change from the present to the future, you know? And so I really don't want people to read my book and think the idea is to have this, you know, um, stable 
um, you know, unmoving image of my future self. And we have to arrive at this version, but rather, you know, the idea is to think about more concretely a possible future self, but then also recognize that things can shift and change over time. And we need to revisit that that self and revisit our, our plans as the years go by. And so that, you know, you asked my favorite story that I think I just love talking to him and there's, there's plenty more. It was actually a really fun endeavor to talk to so many wildly interesting people. I think that's a, a great way to end it. And I will say it was a, a great pleasure to, to read these stories uh, uh, of all the people you met on your journey. So thank you, Hal. Thank you, Martha, okay. for this great conversation. Uh, the book, once again, is Your Future Self, How to Make Tomorrow Better Today. Buy it now. Your future self will thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> hey, I, I, I thank you. And I know there's some great questions here. I'll just say, if people have more questions and you want to reach out on email or LinkedIn or whatever, I'm happy to respond that I didn't get to. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, and I hope everyone will join us for our next book club on July 13, where Martha and I will be joined by Ryan Frederick the author of Right Place, Right Time, The Ultimate Guide to Choosing Home for the Second Half of Life. And then on September 6th, we'll be with Dan Butner talking with him about his new book. will come out in September, The Blue Zone Secrets for Living Longer. And finally, not a book club event, but it is Global Loneliness Awareness Week. So I hope you will join me on Friday for our panel on solving the long loneliness epidemic with Merdad Ayadi of Stanford, Ashwan Kotwal of US UCSF, Harry Reese of University of Rochester, and Jillian Rakusin of the Foundation for Social Connections. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all. And thank you all for the great set of questions. It was really a, a fun conversation. All right. Thanks, you guys.